Hey everyone, Robin from Backscatter here. Uh, today I'm sitting in the studio with our CEO, Jim Decker. How's it going today, Jim? Good to see you, Robin. Yeah, it's good to have you in the studio. Thanks. So today we're taking a look at a little head-to-head -head comparison between the Nikon D850 and the Sony A7R III. Uh, these are both pretty awesome full frame, kind of high-end SLR cameras here. Why are we taking a look at these two cameras head to head, Jim? Well, right now in the SLR and full frame market, these two are the top of the crop right now for image quality uh, and resolution. Okay. So these two are going to be the ones that most people who are looking for a camera in that range are going to be deciding between. Okay, very cool. So one of the first questions that I have to ask is, why are these cameras cool? What, what specifically about this level of camera makes it desirable? Well, Robin, there's a, there's a few things. Um, number one is the sensor in both of these cameras. Uh, Nikon is 46 megapixels. Mm -hmm. The Sony is uh, 42 and a half, okay. around approximately. Um, so they're both super high resolution. But what the development has become in the last few years with these high resolution cameras, they're also really great at low light situations too. Okay, which so, is, it's always kind of been a one or the other before, right? Yeah, is now you can have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, awesome. so, nice. so, it's, so it's really cool there. And uh, so that's, that's where I think people are kind of looking at these cameras because of those two features. Okay. So along with this increase in both low light capabilities and high resolution, where does dynamic range fit into that equation? Well, with the high sensitivity of the sensors, uh, both of these will do really well in dynamic range area. The Nikon D850 is gonna do a little bit better, and okay. that's because it can go down to ISO 64 versus a native ISO 64 mm -hmm. versus the native ISO of 100 with the Sony. Okay. So you get an extra two thirds of stop of dynamic range because you're able to capture that much more highlight detail without knocking out the shadows. So it's not just a, you know, this one goes to 11 kind of thing. That's actually a real benefit. It is a real benefit. That's awesome. So where underwater photographers will appreciate this is sunballs. Mm -hmm. So you can take the uh, ISO, take it down to ISO 64, you're going to get better highlight detail in your sunballs. Nice. As opposed to uh, being at uh, ISO 100. Cool. And, and, still, just, pre and st yeah. still be able to preserve shadow detail awesome. as well. Awesome. So when it comes to actually shooting these cameras in the water, how does the autofocus stack up? What did you notice about using both of these systems? What I noticed is both of them are really great uh, autofocus systems on land. Okay. Uh, I don't think most people are going to be able to tell the difference between these two autofocus systems on land. They're really, really great. Underwater for wide angle photography, mm -hmm. kind of same situation. Okay. Uh, they, they both uh, work really well. The, uh, they have a lot of autofocus points uh, in there. And what I found was that I actually was able to change my shooting style for wide angle How so? with both of these cameras. In the past, I've usually used the center area focus and aimed that at what I wanted the focus point to be and then moved my camera yeah. after I locked the focus down. Compose the shot after exactly. getting the focus. Yeah. Exactly, so I used to shoot that way. With these cameras, the autofocus continuous systems mm -hmm. and the selection, the automatic selection points mm -hmm. work so well that I just let these cameras pick their own focus points. Okay. Uh, and they were right just about 100% of the time. That's pretty Where cool. in the past, the problems I've had, especially underwater, are that some camera systems don't always pick the right spot. Yeah. They'll pick right behind the eye of the fish, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right behind something that, you, that is critical part and it would miss. And so I gave up for a, a long time on that, but these cameras for wide angle work great in That's that That's awesome. Regard. That's really cool. I mean, I'm sure we've all experienced that kind of frustration, you know? And yeah. sometimes in the moment or when you only have limited time with the subject, that autofocus point being close looks pretty good in the moment. It's not till you get it on the big screen later that you go, ah, oh, you know, that's, that can be a shot killer. Yeah, so what, <laughs> I, what I was able to do is, this is especially great for close focus wide angle work. Okay. Because when you're doing close focus wide angle work, when things are just inches and sometimes closer yeah, to the dome. Touching the dome, Almost yeah. touching the dome. Yeah. Then, the depth of field is almost macro-like, okay. where your depth of field is also in inches, mm -hmm. not in feet, 
as you would normally come to expect from a wide angle lens. Mm -hmm. So with that, you need to update focus a lot and make sure you're focusing on the critical area of the subject. Mm -hmm. And both of these cameras picked up the nearest point of the subject, no problem at all, 100% of the time for all the shots that I took with them for my close focus wide angle shots. That is really, really cool. And when you're using a lens like the 8-15 to too, it's kind of nice to have that zoom gear on there, be able to rely on that and take the whole manual focus thing out of the equation. I mean, to have reliably, reliably uh, accurate automatic, you know, autofocus, that's, that's pretty cool. Yes, that was, that was definitely a, a huge boon to my high keeper rate. For sure. When it comes to the macro side of things, we're using primarily manual focus in those situations. Well, I tried it two ways. The D850 would snap the focus like that every single time as long as I was in the proper range. Okay. Obviously, if you drift too close to the subject and you're you're closer than minimum focus distance, mm -hmm. it's not gonna snap the right. focus. Right. But as long as I was within range of what the lens could do, it snapped every single time. Okay, cool. With the Sony, the actual speed of the lens focusing was significantly slower hmm. with the 90. And it would not snap the focus, it would hunt. Hmm. in macro. So it's, I didn't feel that the autofocus for the Sony was anywhere as good for uh, what the D850 is. I would, I would say that the D850 probably has the best macro autofocus of any SLR or mirrorless that I've shot. That's so awesome. Far. That's another so, big claim. That's cool. Yes. And then on top of that, the worst challenge you could ever possibly do with focus system mm -hmm. is put a macro lens be bumping up against the one-to-one -one limit yep. on the reproduction ratio at minimum focus distance, and then take a macro diopter and put that on top of it. Exactly. That's the worst thing you could possibly do. <laughs> it's the most stressful focus test the camera exactly. could possibly have. <laughs> and even with that, the the Nikon snapped the focus. It would snap and pick up on critical parts of the subject. Excellent. Very easily. Um, granted, I didn't use continuous focus on it. I don't use continuous focus for macro mm -hmm. um, because I want it to stop focusing at a certain point because usually yeah. the last little bit of focus is me moving the camera ever so slightly to right. get that last plane of focus on. Mm -hmm. So I used single focus and I picked my own focus point for it. Okay. Um, but with the Sony, it was impossible mm. to focus, to autofocus, shall I say, with a macro diopter on top of the 90 lens. Okay. So with the Sony, I switched over to completely to manual focus. Basically just knew which direction I had to spin the, the, the housing knob on to get it to go to one-to-one, -one, and then I just moved the camera in and out to get my focus. Gotcha. This does bring up another point if we're uh, gonna talk about some manual focus uh, okay. capabilities. Both of these cameras um, do have something called focus peaking mm -hmm. uh, enabled in them. When you're looking through the viewfinder of the D850, you don't have the ability to do focus peaking because that's going to be live view on the back of the screen. Right, and you're seeing an optical image and you're looking, the viewfinder. And here. you're looking optically through the viewfinder. So for someone who maybe doesn't have the best vision, mm -hmm. can't tell absolute tack sharp critical focus right. with their eye, which there are, there are a lot of people that cannot exactly tell, it's a little bit harder to shoot mm -hmm. with the D850 being okay. able to see that. Yeah. However, on the Sony a7R 3 there's a really cool focus peaking feature that you could use either through the viewfinder or in the back of the screen. So it works in the viewfinder too, that's really cool. It does. So you could do uh, a couple things with that. You could set it to uh, any choice of three colors. I like to pick red. Yeah, big contrast. Yeah, it and out. I and so I could. So what it does is any areas of the photo that are in focus, mm -hmm. they get will like kind be of out, red outline. Exactly, yeah. will be outlined in red. And so uh, that makes it really easy to see what's in focus, even if you can't see absolute critical sharpness through a viewfinder. Mm -hmm. So for people who are macro junkies that yeah. really like to shoot the smallest things and especially don't have like the best vision crazy super macro range too exactly yeah then you have then you have that ability to do that nice. and that's how i shot the camera mm -hmm. with that so it makes it way 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 easier awesome you know, well why wouldn't you use all the tools at your disposal you know of course and and i think another advantage is with the electronic viewfinder 
once you get worked into, you got to get in some funky positions mm -hmm. to get some macro subjects. Yeah, for sure. Sometimes and, we're laying in the sand. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes you're laying in sand, you might be upside down. <laughs> right. There's some really weird positions we got to get in. <laughs> but with the D850, if you need to check your photo, mm -hmm. you need to pull your head away from the viewfinder to see the back, to of, see the the back of the screen. Mm. And with an electronic viewfinder, if you have an expanded viewfinder, you've got you that can, image review right You there. get the image review coming through the viewfinder. Yeah. You never have to take your face away from the camera. Mm -hmm. So while the D850 might be better for autofocus and macro situations, mm -hmm. some people might prefer to have the focus peaking feature of the A7R 3 Yeah, definitely for those types worth, of shots. Worth noting between these two for sure. When it comes to the frame rate and the actual speed of shooting, what are you doing with these guys? You know, assuming we've kind of moved between just the single shot, we're getting into some continuous work here. What would you note about the speed? Well, for it's, it's very interesting because both these cameras being over 40 megapixels, that's a large file size and a lot of data. And I remember, process. yeah, I remember the D810, you would take the picture and there'd be a delay it's before the chug picture, along, you yeah, know, yeah. Before the picture came up on the screen. Either. Yeah, yeah. And so now, these cameras are shooting relatively fast okay. uh, for this. I think the D850 is around seven frames a second. Okay. And the Sony is a little bit faster than that. Um, and so this is amazing continuous shooting that you could actually do with mm -hmm. these cameras. Yeah. But the I think what it comes down to is the practicality okay. of it for underwater. Underwater, we're almost always using strobes. Right. So continuous, for underwater shooters, maybe not as much of a big deal. Because the recycle time of that strobe just can't keep up. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So so what uh, what it really comes down to is buffer depth. Okay. So your buffer depth is how many shots you can take before it's got to spit all those images out of the buffer into the card, and right. you're going to have a lag before you're able to shoot again. You might get locked out of the menu, locked out of shooting another exactly. photo. Exactly. Yeah. Both these cameras have such a deep buffer depth that that's not going to happen to you. Got it. Pretty much not so, even a concern. Not even a concern. That's awesome. So you can you can pull the trigger as much as you want. Mm -hmm. And and so I think practically in shooting, there's not too much of a difference. But I would say that for me with the D850, I was able to pull off faster shots. Okay. From shot to shot, as opposed to the A7R3. With the mirrorless, if you do an image review, mm -hmm. you need to tap the shutter to get it out of the image review. Right. Um, the AF on button won't do it. So it's got to be the shutter. So it's got to, you get to tap the shutter or hit the playback button, something mm -hmm. to get out of it. Okay. With the D850, I can just hit the shutter again. I can hit the AF on button again to refocus and it'll go right into it. Cool. So I found myself with the A7R3, of especially a close focus wide angle where I wanted to have focus. Mm -hmm. um, uh, updated for every shot with the AF1 button kind of mashed down and mm -hmm. updating focus constantly. Right. I want. I couldn't do that. Mm -hmm. I would have to look at my shot, hit it, and then do it again. I guess you know I, I could, at a certain extent, depending on the situation, turn off image review, mm -hmm. the automatic image review. Sure. It's kind of a pain in the butt to go back and forth between the two. Yeah, and no matter the shooting situation, not having that instant feedback, one of those things that you know kind of really made us love digital in the first place, that's a big thing to sacrifice. Yeah, you, and you can hit the play button, of sure. course, to bring up the image, but then sure. you have to do something to get it out of the playback mode. Yeah. And that is where the, I'm used to, Maybe it's just me, but I'm just used to hitting the AF on button again to start focusing immediately. And I kept doing that and it went into some other mode in playback. Yeah, so that's that's one of those little details too. I mean, you're gonna feel that on every dive and every shooting situation to some degree. So whether you like it, whether you don't, it's something to note between these two cameras. Yeah, and I, I think that it's overcomable. You know, I shoot so many different cameras mm -hmm. with head back scatter. It's like yeah. I actually personally don't own a camera. <laughs> Because I shoot something new just about every trip. Right. And perhaps if this was my camera, I would get used to that. Now I'd come up with a workaround. But right. for me, I like the, it was more run and gun, the 850. Okay, I I cool. So let's talk a little bit about what kind of glass you're putting on this camera body. What are the lens choices and options like for each? Well, it, it does vary quite a bit. Uh, for Nikon, you're pretty well set. They've got, 
everything uh, now, especially they've came out with this 8 to 15. Yeah. In the last year, the 8 to 15 fisheye zoom lens is awesome. Canon's had one for a few years, now Nikon has one. This is a gold ring lens, so it's their top grade glass mm -hmm. in there, ultra sharp, really great quality. And what 8 to 15 does is it allows you to go from eight millimeters of what we call a full circular fisheye, which is 180 degrees angle coverage in every direction, which mm -hmm. gives you a circular image, mm -hmm. versus the 15 side, which will give you uh, 180 degree diagonal fisheye, which will be from opposite corner to opposite okay. corner. Got it. So that, that so you get the best of both worlds. I know that you don't want to really want to waste a dive. <laughs> yeah. Shooting circular fisheye. Yeah, I mean it's a really cool dramatic look, but it's also a it's dramatic a kind of trick shot. You yeah, know? and you're kind of stuck one way <laughs> yeah. on, on a dive. But this way now, I'd encourage you to take some, but not too many of That's these cool. yeah. of these circular fisheye shots because some of them can be cool. Well, versatility always has its value, you know? Right. So you got so you got that lens. That's my number one go-to wide angle lens for Nikon full frame. Okay. Um because you need to get close to things. Mm -hmm. And so this allows you to get very close and maintain a wide field of view. Excellent. The other lens that I pick for is the 1635 mm -hmm. Nikon. A rectilinear, uh, rectilinear wide zoom. Rectilinear wide zoom. So that's good for pelagic things like sharks. I mean, you gotta be a little farther away from your subject. Exactly. Okay. Or where you can't just can't get that close to them. Right. Yeah. So, or, or, or models in the pool. Okay. There's yeah. another, another one. I usually zoom to around 18, 20, somewhere around there if I'm doing models in a pool. Okay. So that's, that's the wide angle lens selection. Then for macro, very easy, 60 millimeter for uh, fish portraits, mm -hmm. and then 105 for your macro and super macro by adding on a diopter. Okay, cool. So that brings us over to Sony. Mm -hmm. On the Sony lens selection, so you Sony- You got some Canon stuff on there right I now. I do, huh? yeah, <laughs> it is Canon on there. Um, so my wide angle lens of choice for Sony is actually a Canon 8 to 15. <laughs> okay, and how's that possible? Well, that's possible because there's a company called Metabones, and they make an adapter to go between Canon glass and a Sony body. Awesome. And uh, they're on version five of their adapter now, which uh, I had just used on this last trip that I took. Okay. And so in the past, using the Canon 8 to 15 in conjunction with a Sony body and a Moto Bones adapter was kind of a hit and miss affair. Mm -hmm. It would be either slow focus or inaccurate focus or both. Okay. <laughs> and so um, it, it, was, it was more of a challenge. Okay. But what I was really amazed, I got this a couple days before I went on the trip because I was like, oh, I should really try this again and see see what it's like. Because I know the autofocus system on the Sony has been massively improved mm -hmm. ever since they came out with their A9. Mm -hmm. it, it, it has gone light years ahead of where they used to be. Mm -hmm. And so let me try it again. So I tried it and I was completely amazed and shocked that with the 8 to 15, I saw no difference whatsoever between focusing a Canon lens and focusing a Sony lens, That's as far cool. as speed <laughs> and accuracy are concerned. Okay. And to a certain extent, I, it almost felt like some of the Canon lenses might have been a little bit faster than native Sony lenses. Interesting. That was, that was my personal feeling shooting it. Um, but the reason, the main reason picking, picking the 8 to 15 is because there is no really good native Sony wide angle lens fisheye solution. Right, we're a bit there. limited there. Very limited. There is a 28, but it's a 28 prime mm -hmm. that you could put on a fisheye converter onto the front of it. Sure. We've tried that and the corners are so horribly soft. Not really a viable solution. Not viable. Especially not so, the resolution this camera can kick exactly. out. Exactly. Um, so we're, we're not fond of that, situ of that solution. So what I, uh, there's some other options. You can certainly do the 28 with some sort of uh, combination of a flat port and a wet lens. Mm -hmm. And before the Metabones was uh, kind of a thing, mm -hmm. uh, and before it was, had a good enough performance to actually recommend it, that was kind of the, the, the way you would go with it, is you would use a wet lens in combination with a 28. The problem with the wet lens with a 28 is that you're limited to about 130 degrees angle of coverage. Okay. I think for most underwater shooters, especially novice shooters, that is plenty wide enough for them. Mm -hmm. For me as a more advanced shooter, 
I want to get all the way out to 180 degrees. Yeah, you really need the whole thing. I want to get as close to things as possible, get as much light on them from the strobes as possible, eliminate as much water to get as much contrast from the image. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do with it. 130 degrees doesn't really cut it for me. Yeah, I mean, that's still wide enough to be good wide angle shooting, but there's wider. <laughs> exactly, so that was another solution. Um, so that, those were your wide angle options uh, okay. before, or you could use a 1635, which is excellent lens from Sony. Yeah. Uh, those are your wide angle options. So when the Metabones adapter came out for the version five, this is now, I, I, I think making this an actual true viable option, whereas before it was kind of wishy-washy because of the speed and accuracy of the autofocus, but now no problems whatsoever. Close focus, wide angle, continuous focus, have it pick its own focus point. Mm -hmm. It didn't miss. That's really, really awesome. And this is also kind of cool because this is the first time we've seen each respective generation of this camera paired with an eight to 15 lens. And we only got this Nikon eight to 15 last June, right before our digital shootout trip. That's, that's right. So D850 with an eight to 15, a seven R3 with an eight to 15 that works reliably well with autofocus and wide angle. Hey, we're kind of in a whole new ballpark here. That's cool. Those are shooting opportunities that owners of previous generations of these cameras didn't have before. Right, and now moving on from that, macro, uh, Sony came out with a 90 millimeter macro, um, not to, in the too distant past. So mm -hmm. now they actually have a viable macro lens. Like I said, I don't think it focuses fast as the, as the Nikon lens, mm -hmm. but it is still, yeah, it is still a good quality lens to shoot macro with. And I think most macro shooters, macro enthusiasts know the value of having that manual focus too. So uh, autofocus for wide angle, yeah, essential. If it doesn't do it in macro, it's not the end of the world. You know, not a deal breaker for me at least. Depends on the macro shoot. Yeah. <laughs> if you're doing like little critters in Limbe that don't move very much. Yeah, true. Yeah, you know, it's you can yeah, you can pretty much do manual all the time. Mm -hmm. You've got some stuff that's moving around a little bit. It, you know, picking uh, something with a little zip your autofocus, especially when you're not doing super macro. Yeah, that's true. What it's, that's where it's gonna really come into play. Good point. So tell me a little bit about where you've been diving out in the world, putting these cameras to the test. Well, I took these cameras to two different locations. In January, I went to Roatan, and those are some really challenging conditions. Okay. We uh, we stayed at the Coco View Resort, home of the digital shootout. Yep. In Roatan, during that time, it was their rainy season. They okay. normally get nine feet of rain in their rainy season, mm -hmm. and they had a month and a half to go or so. And at that point, they had already gotten 15 feet of rain. Ooh, that's rough. <laughs> and so we had a lot of runoff. Ugh. Uh, it was, they said it was the most rain they've had in 25 years. Uh, it's not and a photographer's so, friend. <laughs> yeah, so we had some really challenging conditions for these cameras. There mm -hmm. are some dives where we were at like ISO 3200 just to get some sort of background at a 60th of a second. Yikes. So it was, <laughs> so it was very challenging for these cameras uh, as far as low light capability, and, <laughs> yeah. and they did really well in those situations. Well, that's so, awesome, yeah. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of a blessing in disguise yeah. for the testing. The other place I went was uh, Little Cayman, okay. and we went to Little Cayman Beach Resort, mm -hmm. where we do a lot of our other wide angle boot camp classes, Lightroom Boot Camp, and also another home to the digital shootout. So uh, we know those waters very well in both of these locations. And so uh, Little Cayman, not their rainy season. Okay. It didn't rain a single <laughs> drop while I was there. Nice. And uh, bright sunshine and super clear viz with no runoff. So complete opposite kind of water uh, conditions. Okay. Uh, to uh, to test these cameras in. So I took them to both those locations, shot them both during the time that I was there. In Roatan, there's the, the Mr. Bud wreck. Mm -hmm. Nice wreck on the south side of the island. It's kind of a cute little boat down there. Yeah. And um, so I did two different dives, and I took these cameras on two different dives. The D850 with the 8 to 15, I can get so close to it, but not as close as I really want to be to light as much of it as I wanted to light. Okay. So I am shooting for post to a certain degree where I know that I'm gonna have some contrast issues with it. Strobes are all the way out, super wide, full power. Ideally, I'd like to be a little bit closer but I just can't, otherwise I wouldn't get the whole image sure. framed up properly. Yeah, so you gotta just turn those strobes up. Right, so you'll turn those strobes up and there's plenty of detail in these files. I was able to go in on the rack, 
kind of paint in some contrast on it, do some white balance adjustments to it mm -hmm. to take care of the contrast you get from when a strobe is too far away. Sure. Optimally for right. your subject. Right. So I was able to get that. It produced really, really nice blues. Um, looked really great. The sun at the top of the frame looks great. Um, and uh, of course, nice thing about speed of shooting is when I'm kind of framing this up and trying to get it framed and lit just right, school of fish come by. So I can just, I just started pulling the trigger mm -hmm. as I see a school of fish come by. Nice. Through the, through the frame. So that's the picture that you're seeing here. Okay. And so performed great. Excellent. So the Sony in that situation, uh, I, I used all, everything the same. I was using uh, YS250 strobes, mm -hmm. uh, really bright to light up the area. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but I had the, the 28 millimeter lens with the uh, fisheye converter on it that gets me out to about, to about 130 degrees. Okay. And so with that only being 130 degrees, to frame the shot, I have to be further away. Right, even so more of a I had to, challenge. Right, exactly, because now my strobes are further away. I got more water between the lens and the subject, more potential for backscatter. It, it was not as bright that day. So when you see these two images combined, don't knock the Sony because the background doesn't quite look as nice as coming out of the Nikon. It's a little bit darker that day and a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. That being said, is it was harder to get the light at that distance. So I don't know if I'd I wouldn't knock the Sony because of that. Um, at the time, I didn't have that Metabones adapter. Otherwise, I would have enjoyed to have had that. I would have been able to frame the shot the same way as a Nikon. Mm -hmm. So I think in this comparison, I think it's kind of a kind of a wash. Okay. Because I think that they both perform excellently. But now with the Metabones adapter, you can get the proper lens so you can get close enough so you can actually pull off the same shot. Excellent. So it really even just closes that gap even tighter, really. Exactly. It's almost yeah. Yeah, kind of yeah, before in January when I didn't have the Metabones adapter, I was a little bit more down on the A7R3 because merely because of lens selection. Sure. But now with the Metabones adapter, that has been completely taken off the table. Nice. All right. So how do they stack up on the macro side of things? Well, on the macro side of things, we kind of discussed earlier, it's all about autofocus mm -hmm. and being able to focus quickly. There's a wreck on the house reef of Cocoa View Resort um, called the Prince Albert. Okay. And there's some resident blennies mm -hmm. on that wreck. And they're on kind of like this football shaped carl there, kind of hanging off of one of the rails. So this is a challenge because there's nowhere to kind of plop down or anything like that. So autofocus is kind of a you know key thing to be able to be able to hover not harm anything and be able to get the shot pulled okay off. yeah so it was, it, was, it was a challenging situation for the macro on, on this one uh, for both cameras or actually more for the diver than the camera <laughs> um, so uh, the Nikon I was able to get the shot a lot quicker because the autofocus would snap right onto it. Mm -hmm. Me personally, I'm used to more looking through a optical viewfinder to be able to see the critical focus. And sometimes, yeah, I might not be able to see the exact sharp critical focus, but I can tell when it's better and I can tell when it's worse. Mm -hmm. And then you take your shot when it's better. Mm -hmm. And that's the technique that I, I use for it. But yeah. it was a lot quicker grabbing focus. And even if I'm kind of drifting back and forth, it could get me in the range and then I can quickly move and get proper focus and take the shot. Takes most of the work out of it. The Sony, on the other hand, most of the time would hunt back and forth. Okay. Back and forth. And so when you're talking about macro and your distance to the subject, if you move your distance by like one inch, that's like a massive amount yeah. of focus right. range right. for macro. And so when you're moving that those kind of distances, it's difficult to know where you're at, where you're at. Am I, do I need to move forward? Do I need to move backward? Where, where is this? And so I found myself getting frustrated in trying to get that set using the autofocus. I just had to switch over completely to manual focus. So I knew where I was at any given time. Right. I right. knew at least my focus was fixed, even if my distance wasn't fixed. Because yeah. if I got two variables moving <laughs> at the same time, I don't know which one is right, and which one is wrong. Exactly. So, I set it to manual. I set it to minimum because I want to get you know pretty 
tight shot. Yeah, highest reproduction guys. ratio possible. Right, and then I just move in. Okay. Um, there's a couple times where that was becoming so difficult, I actually backed the lens off on focus a little bit so I could actually frame the shot out to get a little bit of a wider shot. Okay, yeah. So I, so I did do that, and then I moved back and forth. I used the, the focus peaking to see things in focus, and the nice thing about that is as soon as I see it turn red, hit the trigger. Yeah. Red trigger, red trigger. And so once you get that rhythm in, that would that worked well. But I think in that situation, it was a lot easier for me to pull off the shot, the D850 versus the A7R3. Okay. So if that was your experience in Roatan, let's talk about a little Cayman for a minute. Great. How did these guys do? They both did great. I didn't touch macro the whole time. This is, <laughs> Unless I'm going someplace like Lembe or Analau or someplace known for critter sure. diving, I, I'm i much more interested in wide angle. Well, and to clarify yeah. too, you were there to lead our wide angle boot camp. That so. is true. <laughs> so I didn't even bring a macro lens with me. <laughs> so with these cameras in, uh, in Little Cayman, kind of exact opposite conditions had really great visibility. Uh, it was consistently 100 foot plus. That's awesome. Um, bright sunshine. So great proving ground for nice blue backgrounds with lots of detail. Yeah. So with the D850, um, one of the first shots I took, there was a, at the end of a hour long dive, there was a gigantic barracuda underneath the boat. Nice, at okay. At the safety stop. Cool. So we're in relatively shallow water. We're probably about 15 feet deep. We're doing a safety stop. And uh, with the eight to 15, I was at the 15 side of lens and I got about that close from the dome to the barracuda. Nice to find a barracuda that lets you get that close too. That's yeah, cool, right? you have to stalk those things. Yeah. <laughs> you, have to, you have to be very careful. You can right. spook those things very, very easily. For sure. Um, so I shot at ISO 64 because I wanted to get the most dynamic range possible out mm -hmm. of the shot. Mm -hmm. And barracudas are, are hard to shoot because with your strobes, you have to right. get it just right because otherwise yeah. you'll blow them out because they're very reflective. Mm -hmm. They're like a wall of mirrors. Right, right. And so you're trying to expo try exposing a wall of mirrors, it's very difficult. <laughs> Meanwhile, balancing your background light. Mm -hmm. I was able to pull this particular shot off and the barracuda came out just a little hot okay. in a couple areas. I was able to take the Lightroom slider and for highlights, pull that down and pull them right in. Nice. Uh, so no problem on that. And I had a nice blue background, looked great out of camera. The, uh, the detail on the surface is all there with the 46 megapixels of resolution. Mm -hmm. This image, especially with the updating the focus continuously mm -hmm. and being really sharp on that eye, this will make a great print. Yeah, absolutely. For 46 megapixels of resolution, throwing this up on the wall with the focus where it's at, the highlight detail where it's at, the background detail, the dynamic range, this will make a great print. Yeah, awesome. So that it, it worked out really well. With the Sony mm -hmm. on wide angle with the 8 to 15, it's able to do a circular fisheye, which you can't do with any Sony <laughs> right. wide angle lens. Yeah, you gotta point. play with that, you know? So circular fisheye, like, let me give this a shot. Mm -hmm. Groupers and Little Cayman are very friendly yeah. and get really close. Right. And so with the 8 to 15, I was able to do a circular fisheye shot and I wanted to get one uh, just to try it out. And my good teaching partner for all the wide angle boot camps, Erin Quigley, she was there. And she became a model in the photo, saw it was going down. Mm -hmm. She got in position. I had the sun ball behind it. As all good dive photo buddies will do. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> uh, so we were able to uh, pull off the shot together rather quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, I was able to focus on the on the grouper, which was practically touching the dome, okay. just about there, wow, nice. to get this kind of a shot mm -hmm. with a circular fisheye, to get this kind of image where the grouper is so large in the frame, it has to be almost touching the dome. Right. And so the camera autofocus picked up very quickly was able to hold on the grouper and I got was able to pull off the shot. Excellent. And the blues look awesome, the color looks awesome. So I think again, for image quality wise, I don't know if there's enough of a difference between these two to say that one is better than the other for wide angle photography. I really think that uh, you, you're gonna be happy with picking either one of these. Well, it's nice to have a, a wide angle win-win, you know? So that's a pretty comprehensive review of the still capabilities here. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good about what we've covered. So let's talk a little bit about video. 
Uh, what have you found so far with video capabilities of these two systems? Well, I've kind of been, not been a fan of the video capabilities of both these systems for a while, especially Nikon. Mm -hmm. Nikon has been traditionally the worst as far as the video capabilities. Things like color concerned. coming out of the camera and all the above. Okay. It's everything. It was the color that was coming out of the camera, not even able being able to pull off a white balance mm -hmm. underwater. Um, if it did, it kind of looked murky, mm. um, low bit rates. The uh, and then most more recently with the D500 and D5, they had a severe over two point you know, won the crop mm -hmm. of the sensor mm -hmm. for shooting 4K, which basically rendered your wide angle useless. Right. Um, so not a lot of things for fans to cheer about for Nikon for video. Okay. Uh, as far as Sony is concerned in the past, the only real major issue has been the inability to white balance above 9,900 degrees yeah, Kelvin. Not having it would always temperature range. Yeah, it would always just top out at 9,900. Mm -hmm. And it said white balance error, 9,900, continue. Yeah. So um, that's been Sony's issue. So when I got these cameras to test in both these locations, especially when I was in first and Rotan, it's like, well, at the end of the week, I'll do a cursory you know, test on video just to say I did it. Right. I'm not gonna waste my time on it. <laughs> right. And towards the end of the week I was doing this, it's like I did it first with the the Nikon camera. It white balanced. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> this actually looks decent. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so what I did was I tried it and it white balanced really well. Huh. And the colors came out really good. And what we've kind of said in the underwater industry is is Canon color. Sure, sure. And so with uh, underwater since Canon came out with the video spec for the 5D Mark II for the first time, mm -hmm. um, and we we're able to white balance underwater, we're like, wow, look at that color come straight out of the camera. The blues are great. It all looks naturally lit. So when we uh, we kind of compared every other camera to that, I would, you know, it's almost safe to say that the Nikon is probably 90% there. Okay, wow, that's uh, awesome. That. Yeah, it is great. There's kind of a couple weird things with it though. For some reason. I'm not able to bounce off sand. Really? The thing that you would think that yeah. you would normally balance off right. of, sand or your hand. And I don't carry a white card card anymore. I usually just use the sand in sure. my hand. Um, so where'd you get a good result? The reef. Okay. Really? It would. Yeah. So what it would do is like you would go to take a uh, white balance on the sand. It would. It would. Uh, it would give you an error. 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 I just. I keep trying. 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 Wouldn't do it. Hit it on a reef. It would take. <laughs> So there you go. <laughs> yeah, so be it. The uh, the other is that uh, I wasn't. The downside is that I wasn't able to get it to balance below fifty feet. Okay. Okay. So fifty feet was about the limit. It just would error out. That's like that. generally our testing limit too. I mean, that's a. For, I think for ambient light white balance, yeah. below fifty feet, if you're trying to execute a white balance, you've got more leeway because the red loss is so great at that depth. If you go five feet deeper you're not really running into too many more issues mm -hmm. uh, with white balance at that point. Um, you know, if you're getting down to 60, that's almost the limit where you wanna kick on lights right. instead of going with ambient because things kind of almost turn monochrome at that point, mm -hmm. little hints of red around. So it's, uh, I would say that um, I don't consider it that depth limit being a huge hindrance to it. Okay. Maybe for the professional videographer, this isn't for them. Mm -hmm. But for someone who's a still photographer who wants to pick up a little bit of video, this would be this would be good. And there's some other advantages to it as well. Okay. So the other advantage is that when you switch between video mode and photo mode on the camera, your settings for each one of those stay where they were. Awesome. So nice. if you are shooting stills mm -hmm. and you've got auto white balance, 1 125th, 1 F8, mm -hmm. ISO 100, great. You can leave that there, you switch over to video, you can go to a custom white balance, execute one, um, slow your shutter speed down to a 60th, mm -hmm. uh, have a different aperture, have a different ISO for the ambient light conditions that you're shooting. You can do that and then switch back over, you don't have to go through and switch all that stuff back again. Nice. So when you switch between modes, the settings stay. That's really cool. The other nice thing is this is doing 4K video at the full width of the sensor. Yeah. So that's really great. So your wide angle lens is actually wide. A lot of right. other uh, uh, cameras are cropping it a bit on this. So this stays nice and wide. Excellent. 
Other nice thing is that you can go from an FX or the full frame format down to DX format. If you want that crop. If you want that crop, but you're still gonna be at 4K. Okay. So the nice thing is your eight to 15 lens, for all those people who had crop sensor Nikon cameras and love that 10 to 17, well, if you go to uh, DX mode, well now you've got a 10 to 15. Hmm. So you've got some zoom range now with your eight to 15, where in video you kind of tend to, tend to not want to be quite as wide sure, for your sure. shots. Usually you want to be in a little bit tighter. So having that capability going to uh, DX mode with an uh, eight to 15, use it from about 10 to 15, that's kind of, uh, I think a great benefit too. And then if you're doing any macro video, you get a tighter crop, but you're still in 4K. Fantastic. So you can get some uh, tighter shots on it, still preserve your depth of field. Nice. Um, if you, as if you're shooting at full frame. So that's, those are some advantages to it. The, uh, the major disadvantage I think in, in shooting the video on Nikon is that you don't get to see a meter okay. on the camera at all. Hmm. So it's like, typically the technique is that you shoot uh, two thirds of a stop underexposed uh, on the meter mm -hmm. and you get really nice color saturation that way mm -hmm. um, and uh, prevents the image from looking a little too flat. Sure. Yeah, so it kind of makes the colors pop. Um, and because we know the, the the final destination is probably going to be an HDTV of some sort. Right. And so when you're looking on your HDTV, those those monitors tend to over sharpen, over contrast things. So if you have any highlights, they usually get really crunchy mm. and kind of almost blown out mm -hmm. when they get by the time they get to the TV. Mm -hmm. Those things kind of they look brighter on the TV. Right. So if you underexpose it by like two thirds, that's perfect. the yeah, yeah okay. happy really place. Good. Cool. So I, I think that. Um, not having that ability to see the meter is a little bit of an issue. However, the workaround that I found is going to uh, exposure compensation. Okay. So I would set my ISO to auto ISO and exposure compensation to negative two thirds. And by doing that, I could get a nicely exposed scene at exactly where I would want on the meter. Awesome. So someone might say, well, duh, why don't you just do that on any other camera? That's because sometimes I might move the camera. And if I move the camera, the scene might be changing, the exposure conditions might be changing. I don't necessarily want the exposure to jack all over the place, mm -hmm. you know, go up and down and stuff while I'm shooting. Yeah. So I'd say with, shot. yeah, so what I would say with Nikon, the thing to do is keep this in mind and try and just shoot in one direction per shot. Okay. And how about with the A7R three? First of all, on the white balance, it's it's kind of hit and miss. Okay. Um, one thing that it got that, that did get changed on it is that it is now able to white balance at values over ninety nine hundred. Okay. Kelvin. So that was a major major improvement for for Sony. What happens is in the past you would say it would say error ninety nine hundred and that's the max it would do and it would put it into one of the white balance banks in the camera. What you're able to do now is when you execute that white balance, it says greater than 9,900. So it still doesn't tell you what it is. It okay. tells you it's greater and then uh, it, it you can save to one of the white balance banks. What I found though is that in Roatan, it seemed to do pretty well in really, really bad low vis low light conditions. Interesting, not, um, not what you would expect. Not what you expect, and the, the colors came out looking pretty decent. Okay. You know, and, uh, but when I was in Little Cayman with excellent visibility, what I found was that the camera would, the foreground would look not so bad, mm -hmm. but the water and things in the background would be very purple. Interesting. Like, like overly purple consistently. Um, to the point where I was trying, there's a tint adjustment you can do on most of these cameras for white balance. Mm -hmm. So I tried the tint adjustment. I tried all sorts of settings on it and tried to experiment. I couldn't get it to look right in camera. Hmm. I think maybe if I got a slate and you and I went down there and Spend we got a tripod yeah. and we scientifically went through, <clears throat> right. you know, a hundred different tint settings, <laughs> yeah. we could find one that kind of worked for that scene. And then we could see if we could replicate that on other scenes to see if that still worked. Mm -hmm. I don't have that kind of time. Yeah, who does? Yeah. 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 Well, I didn't have that time on that trip. You know, so it sounds like a something maybe a fun thing to do, but <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't have that kind of time on that trip. So I uh, I was not really able to pull off an accurate white balance in camera 
underwater wide angle with the A7R Mark III. Okay. Um, however, I you know I brought it into Lightroom, and my good teaching Aaron uh, Quigley, uh, teaching partner Aaron Quigley was right there, and mm -hmm. we looked at it. She's like, "Oh, that's easy. Purple slider." <laughs> so all we did was we uh, took the purple slider in Lightroom. Mm -hmm. Actually, what we did is we took a JPEG of the of the uh, of a, of a frame, Spring, right? yeah, and then we're able to make adjustments. Then you can synchronize the adjustments. Okay. In the video. Nice. So what we did was. We did that and just purple slider. That's all we did, moved it all the just way it to the left. Mm -hmm. And you can see on the screen here, the difference, just moving one slider. That is crazy cool. So it is, uh, I wouldn't say that it's a hard no mm -hmm. on the video. You just gotta know going in, eyes wide open, going into this, if you're really interested in video, if you're doing macro videos, do great. Sure. Um, but wide angle video with that color, yeah, it's kind of You're gonna be working. doing some color work in post. Yeah, if you're using lights, not a problem. Shoot mm -hmm. auto white balance, you'd be fine. Um, but for wide angle, you're going to need to color correct everything. It's not, it wasn't hard, it was one slider. Mm -hmm. um, and I was amazed how much it pulled back because I've had other clips before that have been overly red where they've been white balanced. Right. Um, a little, uh, you know, a little too uh, deep, and then brought back shallow. Yep. It's, too, it's overly red. Yeah. Trying to crack that in post is really, really hard. It falls apart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're not even falling apart. Just even difficult to even execute to make. You <laughs> sit there tweaking it and still not getting it right. Yeah. Well, this one, it was just it literally one slider all the way over here, and it looked great. That's awesome. So um, that's what you're seeing on the screen. Excellent. So after all the shooting experience, what are some of your favorite things about these systems and what were some of your least favorite things? Well, I definitely say that for me, the uh, favorite things about the, both these systems uh, is autofocus. Okay. That, that is one of the things, you know, you can have all the resolution in the world, mm -hmm. they ain't in focus, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, <laughs> well said. So uh, both these autofocus systems allowed me to get a much higher keeper rate than I was in the past. Okay. So that was, that was really key. Um, other things that I like is obviously the image quality and resolution. The image quality on both these cameras is the two best. The Nikon, I think, is going to take the cake for Edges the best. Out, yeah. yeah, it's going to edge out the Sony by a small margin, but it still edges it out mm -hmm. in image quality. Okay. Um, so both of these cameras, both excellent. These two are the top of the heap mm -hmm. as far as image quality for any full frame camera that's out there right now. Excellent. What were some of the weak points? Uh, I think the weak points uh, on these cameras, uh, for both of them, you know, certainly video to a certain degree. Sure. I massively approved, especially on the D850. I mean, if there's a award for most improved video functionality <laughs> uh, of a camera for a year, it's yeah. definitely the D850. I mean, because it was abysmal before. Right, right. In, in, uh, with the previous iterations, but now, I mean, it's leapfrogged way ahead. Fantastic. Um, arguably ahead of where Sony was. Sony has had a marginal improvement because of the white balance. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually now at least able to white balance greater than 9900. It still doesn't come out correct mm -hmm. or perfect every time. Mm -hmm. But you at least have something you can adjust now. And uh, and uh, so you'll be able to do something with it. So I think that the, that's a little bit of a, a downside on the Sony. The other uh, downside I think on the Sony is that the uh, is the lens selection. I would certainly like to see a native Sony professional grade mm -hmm. fisheye lens. That could really change the equation there. I, I think it could. Um, you know, the Metabones adapter isn't inexpensive it's about 399 for metabones adapter to then put on top of your you know you know 1499 canon lens here so but it it's is not it's, at least performance wise it's a viable workaround yeah but not an inexpensive wise, one not exp inexpensive one it's just another cog in the wheel and some housings it's a little bit of pain in the butt to sure. to put these together uh, mm -hmm. this combination together so it's a uh, i think it's a little bit another kind of downside for uh for sony I think it's really going to come down to the individual person okay. on these. And what do they need to ask themselves to find which system is for them? I think number one is going to be what type of shooting are you doing? Do you have an interest in wide angle video at all? Mm -hmm. If you do, then I think the D850 is going to kind of be your choice. Okay. Uh, like I said, the video is not perfect, but if you want to dabble in video, but you're a serious photographer mm -hmm. and photos are your thing, 
then this way I think would be the better, the better choice for that. Um, I think that if you're a stills photographer that likes wide angle, mm -hmm. me personally, I like looking through the viewfinder better than looking through, uh, looking on a screen. Mm -hmm. One thing about, uh, about mirrorless cameras is that they don't have the same dynamic range as an eye mm -hmm. as far as when you're looking through your preview on your screen. So a lot of wide angle scenes are overly backlit and your foreground is in shadows. It's hard to see what you're doing to frame. Right. So if you're doing wide angle photography, just from a usability standpoint, not an image quality standpoint, but from a usability standpoint, I would go with a Nikon D850. Okay. As far as macro is concerned, this is where it's gonna be more down to, I think, personal preference. Okay. Um, me personally, again, I like the D850 for this because I like looking through the electronic viewfinder, I'm sorry, the optical viewfinder, mm -hmm. and I like the, uh, the autofocus speed that I get with that. Granted that when I'm doing super macro, most of the time, I am not using autofocus at all. I am purely manual focusing and moving the camera back and forth. But for those slightly larger macro subjects, being able to snap the focus is, is, is really, uh, really great and you can get a lot faster um i guess get your keeper shot a lot faster than there you go. with another nice. camera all right uh, as far as what this wouldn't be for is someone who has some vision issues mm -hmm. uh, where they couldn't see critical focus and i should probably take that back and say i don't think you need to see absolute critical focus i think you need to be able to recognize between soft and sharper right and be able to recognize that when you're going through the focus range and recognizing where it's not maybe it's not sharp to your eye mm -hmm. but it's the sharpest that you can see and be able to identify that okay. if you have issues with that then perhaps the a7r3 would be a better choice with, with the, the focus, focus peaking, peaking. Yeah. focus peaking you can use the electronic viewfinder uh, to see the focus peaking, you might not see critical focus on that, but you can see the focus peaking and be able to pick out areas of the subject very quickly that should be in focus, like the eye, the mouth, and be able to fire off some shots. So I think that would be a, a more of a benefit for people to have those, those vision issues. Kind of misconception, I think, a lot of times is people say, oh, well, mirrorless is so much smaller. Mm -hmm. And that being said, yeah. and you look at these two cameras, Yes. <laughs> How For much sure. smaller is it again? For sure, <laughs> the, the Sony is smaller. Smaller, but not And by yes, much. the housings are a bit smaller. Mm -hmm. But one thing that you can't get around is that you're dealing with full frame glass. Mm -hmm. Full frame lenses. For your, for your systems. And you cannot get around the physics of the requirements of size for a full frame sensor. It mm -hmm. doesn't matter what size the camera is, it mm -hmm. matters what size the sensor is. Mm -hmm. And so I really, there's really no difference in size of the lenses. That means optically, there's not gonna be much in difference in size of domes and ports right. to accommodate these physical sizes of lenses and needing the optical quality for it. You still need a large dome for a rectilinear wide angle zoom runs for a full frame lens. It doesn't matter if it's mirrorless or not. So that being said, your ports are gonna be about the same size. Housing, yeah, it's a little bit smaller. Mm -hmm. For sure it is, but it's not, not, not tons a smaller. Yeah, yeah not yeah. a huge, huge difference. Plus you still gotta factor in your lighting, your control arms, things like that. And again, the scene doesn't care mm -hmm. whether you have a mirrorless camera that's small or not. You <laughs> right. still need this, the arms for your strobes to get them out to light the scene. Mm -hmm. The scene doesn't care about that. Yep. And you still need the appropriate strobes to be able to light the scene. And you either way. Yeah, you can't use yeah. a lower powered strobe just because your camera's smaller. Right, and you're probably still putting it all into one big check bag. You know, it's travel, yep. it's kind of same for same space Yeah, I mean, if you're splitting hairs, you know, yes, this is gonna be a little bit easier to travel with sure. if you're gonna carry it on. But if, yeah. you're not gonna, if you're not carrying it on, it really doesn't make much of a difference. Right. Where it does is top side. Okay. And right. I would certainly- Carrying it around all day, that yeah. kind of thing. One yeah. of the things I like to do is I, I like to shoot concerts. Mm -hmm. And for me, I'll take a Sony to a concert because the focus is really great. And the other great thing is I have to put the camera in a lot of what I call blind shot positions mm -hmm. where I can't look through a viewfinder. Mm -hmm. So I'm just guessing. Well, in a dark environment of a concert, I can flip out that screen, mm -hmm. look at the screen, frame my shot, 
and do continuous shooting and get those shots. Nice, yeah. And so the Sony is smaller and lighter, definitely, to take care of those kind of uh, shooting situations opposed to the Nikon where I have to look through the viewfinder. Yeah. So that's where I think mirrorless does have a little bit of advantage there if you're, if you're doing some topside stuff with it. Um, but other than that, me personally, I'm gonna pick the D850. Um, and the primary reason is optical viewfinder is is the is the choice for me for the ease of seeing what I'm doing wide angle shooting and for how I shoot macro. Excellent. And seeing as how you're leading our expedition next week to uh, go spend a couple days at sea out at the Socorro Islands going after wide angle big animal subjects, pretty safe to say you're packing the D850 in your suitcase. Actually, I'm packing both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I am taking both of them with me on that trip. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. On that note, I think we can wrap up this little conversation. And of course, if you have any questions or you'd like to learn more about these systems, feel free to call us here at Backscatter, where we dive, shoot, and service everything we sell, and we're always happy to help. Thanks for watching. Thanks. <laughs>